And now back to Inside Track. Hi there. Welcome back to Inside Track. Uh, Three o'clock hour. Our guest for the next two segments, Eric Pratt of Gun Owners of America. Welcome, Eric. Well, welcome to you. It's great to be with you. Yeah, you've been. I think you've been here before. I think your dad's been here before. And my uh, uh, microphone will be shared on this side by uh, my good friend Bruce Ash, the Republican National Committeeman from Arizona. Eric, uh, great to make your acquaintance, and I I see your 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 propaganda all the time, and I'm I'm an enthusiastic <laughs> reader. Well, excellent. I'm so glad to hear that, Bruce. Thank you. Well. Alleged mentally ill veterans and seniors are going to be included in the Obama executive order. Now, how are we going to fight this one? But let's first of all explain what it is we're going to have to fight. Yeah, this, uh, what the president is doing is lawless, uh, obviously. He's circumventing Congress, circumventing the Constitution to place restrictions on law-abiding Americans. And part of what he's going after is to basically do to senior citizens what has already been been done to almost 200,000 military veterans. Basically, with military veterans, these are guys who have gone off to war. They've fought hard uh, for their country. They come back, and they're dealing with things like PTSD, uh, and somebody is is, uh, assigned to handle their financial affairs, and then, bam, with that act, they are deemed as mentally incompetent because of that, and they lose their Second Amendment rights. So, you know, thank you for serving your country. Now hand over your firearms. Uh, it, it's an atrocity what's happened. There's even been um, uh, vets who are dealing with anxiety and, and on anxiety medicine. And because of that, because of the state they live in, their state deems that as being mentally incompetent. So now the president wants to apply that to senior citizens who are receiving Social Security benefits. So if a senior has had somebody um, uh, appointed to handle their financial affairs, you know, and usually that happens because they're getting forgetful, they're not balancing the checkbook now, they're going to lose their Second Amendment rights. And, oh, my goodness, I mean, if we're going to strip people's rights for not balancing their checkbook, how about we start with the president and the Congress? When was the last time they balanced the nation's checkbook, right? Eric, you know, it's amazing uh, what the president has done, and it's the unintended consequences of this power grab, is he's basically uh, created uh, uh, an institution around people who are um, uh, having problems, uh, may may keep them away from getting the help that they need from time to time because they're afraid that they might lose their rights. And this is all government sanctioned. I mean, think about the vets, you know, as, as one group, you know, who have gone through some pretty severe trauma who, who may uh, at some point in time need to, to seek counseling. I mean, this would perhaps keep them away from getting the counseling that they need. I mean, this is, this is atrocious policy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, you mentioned the word unintended consequence. And and let me even broaden that a little more for a little bit of history. Another unintended consequence is that of what happened in 1993 with the Brady Bill when we set, or the Brady Law, when we set up the government to screen people before they exercise a God-given right, a constitutionally protected right, like the Second Amendment. When you put government in the position of forcing people to prove their innocence to the government before they can exercise their God-given rights. That is very dangerous. And for a long time, you know, people have, have lived with it, you know, with the instant check, they think, ah, oh, it's, it's not, you know, it's relatively harmless. You go in, you come out with your gun in five minutes, what's the big deal? Well, this is the big deal. Now we're seeing the ugly face of it, of how an anti-gun administration can abuse that principle. For, and, and that's why, by the way, Gun Owners of America has never, from its inception, never supported the background check. Look, we don't screen reporters before publishing articles. We don't screen you guys. When I say we, I mean government doesn't screen you guys before doing your show. Yeah. Make sure you're not... What's that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> They've been trying to do that for seven years. And quite honestly, isn't that the problem? Is is once you concede the point in one area, it's like a little bit of leaven that leavens the whole loaf. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, not yet. 
And, and, but this is the real problem, is once you let government screen people, once people have to prove their innocence to the government, and we even saw that in Houston temporarily, didn't we? Uh, pastors were being yep. required yep. to submit their sermons yep. to make sure that you know, they were politically correct. Yep. Well, see, so now we're seeing the ugly face of this as it's been applied to uh, veterans, and now the Obama administration wants to uh, spread it to uh, senior citizens. So... Um this this problem as as insidious as it is um the 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 now institutionalizing of the background checks even to include grandpa who wants to sell all of the guns that he's collected over a period of time because he's maybe got grand you know grandbaby girls uh, who you know don't want his guns he now has to go out and get an ffl yeah, and if he doesn't, if he sells one or two guns without a background check, he could spend five years in jail and be fined two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I want to Is sell that, Bruce one of my guns. How do I get a background check? I'm not if authorized you want, to do that. I'm not a licensed dealer. Well, we don't quite know yet what what this is going to look like. I, I'm assuming the uh, the administration is going to submit regulations on this. They've kind of just given us the outline and summary form. Of, of what's coming, what they're going to be doing. And they've told us that they're going to be uh, rolling out a whole bunch of uh, regulations in the Federal Register. So obviously we're, we're waiting with bated breath here so we can attack these things. Uh, you know, th this is really pernicious. You know, last year the, the president, of course, tried this with uh, ammunition. Uh, right. they, they put a, an ammunition ban in the Federal Register. We were actually able to beat it back. We generated along with other gun groups, over 300,000 uh, letters, emails, et cetera, in opposition, and the ATF backed off. I mean, it's going to take that type of vigorous response in addition to engaging the Congress. And, you know, I was listening to the commercial just uh, that, that, you, that you did, Bruce, and, you know, there are a lot of people that are upset with Republicans for rolling over all the time and being weenies. But I will say this, because the Second Amendment community is so active, we've actually been very successful in rolling back a lot of the Obama anti-gun agenda over the last seven years, much to his chagrin. Yeah, you know, so so on on the background checks, um, how many? What's the percentage of crimes that are committed by people who have done a background check? Percentage of crimes committed by people who have done, it, it's extremely, it's less than 1%. I mean, it is extremely, extremely low. Now, what's interesting, uh, I mean, obviously some do, and in fact, uh, every one of the mass shootings that occurred last year uh, occurred by somebody who, or uh, by people who had successfully passed the background checks. Well, well those I are the legitimately actual mass shootings where someone was actually shot. I think we now have an administration that if I take out a gun and wave it in a crowded room, it counts as a mass shooting. They're, <laughs> well, pre they're pretty yeah, close but... to defining it that far down to have fake numbers so they can lie about it some well, more. And the reason I asked the question, Eric, was that uh, it's not it's not the people who get themselves submitted for background checks who are committing the crimes. They're the guy, like in Philadelphia, who shot the Philadelphia cop the other day, who got a gun that was stolen, and in fact this happened to be a police officer's gun that that, that was stolen, and you know, use it to commit that crime. Um, there are tons and tons of guns that exist. Having, uh, you know, more strict background check uh, laws isn't going to help prevent crimes, and the kids who are getting murdered by the dozens in Chicago and Baltimore and Detroit and Atlanta and Houston and Phoenix and every place else, this isn't going to help them. You know, oh, the, the mental not. the mental check background things, not going to help any of those kids. I mean, there are literally thousands of kids being killed every year, um, you know, through violent crimes, uh, and those guys got guns from whoever the, you know, hell knows where they got them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, you know, as evidence of that, look at the mass shootings that occurred in France last year. Right. Uh, those terrorists uh, obviously didn't go through background checks to, to get their firearms. It, it is very difficult to get a firearm in France. They have far more restrictions on, on getting a firearm. But and the bad guys get them. But bad guys get them. And further to that, uh, it, it is, I, I don't think it is 
physically possible to get a concealed carry permit in France. Heck, even some of their police, remember the Charlie Hebdo shooting, don't carry firearms. So, uh, you know, you can just scratch out concealed carry or open carry in France, and yet we saw terrorists carrying firearms. So they, you know, and that's, isn't that the old adage that bad guys don't obey the law? That's why they're bad guys. So, yeah, I mean, all the background checks in the world uh, have been ineffective, and here the president is doubling down. You know, it kind of reminds me of what Einstein supposedly said about insanity, redoubling your efforts, expecting to uh, achieve a different result. Uh, you know, background checks aren't working. They're not making people safer, and yet now we're going to have more of them. Hey, we're going to take a, a quick break, but when we come back, I'd like to talk to you about the, the seriousness of the president or his lack of seriousness. He proposed uh, more FBI agents and more ATF agents, uh, but uh, hasn't put any funding in the budget for that. So when we come back with Eric Pratt, we'll start with that. I got my ticket for the long way round A bottle of whiskey for the way And I sure would like some sweet company And I'm leaving tomorrow, what do you say? When I'm When I'm gone You're gonna miss me when I'm gone Inside Track will be right back. Guns. I like the way they look I like the shiny steel and the polished wood I don't care if they're big or small If they're for sale, hell, I want them all I like guns, I like guns, I like guns And now, back to Inside Track Okay, we're back with Eric Pratt of Gun Owners of America talking about whatever the president seems to be up to so why didn't he put any money? He talked He talked a pretty good game. He tried to kind of soften, uh, you know, for some people, the, the impact of his uh, uh, gun changes uh, by saying, well, you know, we're going to get some more FBI agents, we're going to get some more ATF agents. I don't know why we need more ATF agents, but that's besides the point. But then, even though he puts that we, in his proposal... We don't have proposal, enough FBI agents to check out terrorists, so we're going to hire right. more of them to do background checks. That'll right. work. Right. So, so then he he doesn't he doesn't put any of that into the budget. So he's just blowing smoke up everybody's rear, isn't he? <laughs> well, I, I think we will see when he submits his budget to the Congress. He will be asking for more. Now, typically, Congress just totally disregards his budget, and they should. And in fact, we're going to be pressing Congress to defund these initiatives. But yeah, he wants more ATF and FBI agents to harass gun owners, but. You know, does he ask for more border agents? Uh, uh, you, I mean, that just right there shows his priorities. You know, he said on Thursday in that town hall meeting that he wants to make guns more expensive and harder to get. I, I think that right there in a, uh, in a maybe honest moment, if you will, he revealed what we really know his agenda is. He wants fewer and fewer people getting guns, and he wants to make it harder to get firearms, and that's what all this is aimed at. It's really not aimed, as you look through uh, his lawless decrees uh, that he issued this week, none of it deals with uh, punishing and getting tougher on bad guys. It's all about putting a chilling effect on the exercise of our God-given rights, making it harder uh, to exercise our right to keep and bear arms. Eric, hang on. We're taking a call from Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, Larry, I'm kind of a dis <clears throat> disaffected third party in this deal because all of my guns were lost in a hor horrific boating accident a couple years ago. But is this going to be like, and I, I want to say it was 83 when Papa Bush was in, is, is the way it looks to you, does he just kind of hand this, this dream package of garbage over to the ATF and then they write what I call administrative law? And it becomes the law of the land without any congressional approval whatsoever? Uh, sadly, yes. That's the way all this works. Now, there will be a comment period, which is oftentimes is a dog and pony show. But when the regulations do go into effect, even though they can go into effect without congressional approval, Congress can defund them. And we've actually worked with Congress to do that. Heck, we 
uh, early on in the president's administration, we repealed the, uh, the, the gun ban in national parks, and we did that as by uh, getting a rider on a bill that he desperately wanted. Uh, we've also repealed or defunded, cut the funding for many of his other initiatives, like um, a shotgun import ban. He had another registration initiative. And there have been other things like that, that we uh, Operation Choke Point was one of them. So we, we've worked through Congress to defund these things. And that's what we're going to be working this year through the legislative appropriation uh, process to cut the funding for these uh, initiatives as well. Yeah, but in the case of these suckers, can't we take them as an opportunity to challenge the constitutionality in court? Well, absolutely. And in fact, uh, if we're not successful doing this through the Congress, then that's absolutely what we'll do. And we're already looking at that. I, you know, I think you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You try to fight this uh, many different ways. But it, I, I will tell you this, it's much more expensive and a much longer term uh, fighting it in court. Plus, uh, further complicating that is before the Republicans took over the Senate, Harry Reid was approving like 10 judges a day because they nuked the filibuster. And so the Republicans had no way to stop uh, judges from being added to the federal courts. And so Obama had virtually a full year of just packing the courts. So it's always a gamble when you spend all that money and go through the court system. It's a lot safer bet to just defund it uh, through congressional appropriation. Or get the right president to rescind it. All right, Sean, thank can, you. Can, can I ask, I mean, on a, from Good a legal quick. standpoint, once it's law, though, when you say defund it, you mean defund the enforcement? or I mean, once it's a law, if they say you broke the law, and I'm talking about Amos selling a gun to Bruce, all this stuff put uh, on here, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, if your weird uncle's got a gun or something, you're supposed to report it to the FBI and all that stuff. Isn't, uh, what I can't understand is they come out with this, uh, if somebody's wearing something different or something, and if you profile them, it's profiling them, you can go to jail. But at the same time, is if you, if a neighbor says that you got a gun, you're acting weird, you're supposed to call the FBI or something. And <laughs> is this profiling? Yeah, I think R.D.'s point, that's a great point, eh? but who would expect anti-gun liberals to be consistent, right? <laughs> I mean, this just well, shows they have an agenda. They want to make yeah. it harder for people to have guns, and they want to take away their guns, and so they will throw out, and I think you're talking about California's law, uh, which is just insidious, but that that's exactly what they're after doing. You right. know, you're, you're damn, I mean, you know, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, I mean, it just seems, you know, if you got a crazy uncle or something has a gun, never bothered nobody in his life, i got three generations of guns sitting here, never shot anything but ducks and, you know, and all that, but somebody in neighbors says, man, I'm acting weird, and they can come in here and take all my guns because a neighbor says something, isn't that profiling? It's yeah, worse. Well, I think it's worse than that. But uh, Yeah, well. Eric and, R uh, Eric and R.D., you know, um, I, I thought it was a little hardcore that Gun Owners of America had always opposed uh, the, the background checks. But actually, what happened this week is a perfect example why Gun Owners of America was right from the very beginning. Because once you give the government the in to do something like yeah. this they're going to continue to take liberties against all of us and and this right. is and this is just the the most pernicious you said this you described it before this is the most pernicious kind of action that can be taken against american citizens and their second isn't amendment like rights the old, oh, isn't it like the old vacuum cleaner days you know you knocked at the door and the guy slept with a vacuum cleaner and throw dirt in your floor and then, well, I'll sell you a vacuum cleaner. And once you get to the door, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, but you can clean up the dirt. Hey, R.D., yeah. thanks very much for your call. Eric, thank you very much for appearing on the show today. Very, very timely, and we got to have you back soon. You're awesome. Absolutely. Would love to. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. Thank thanks you, for your Eric. work. Appreciate it. Eric Pratt. Inside Track will be 
I was toting my pack along a dusty gravel road when along came a semi. Hind canvas covered load. We're heading south along this track with me, you can ride. So I climbed into his cab. I settled yeah. down inside. He asked me if I'd ever seen a gun like the one he held in his hand. Like and I said, listen, mate, I fired all types of guns in this here land. Well, I've shot every gun, man, I've shot every gun, man There isn't one I'd shun, man, cause I've had so much fun, man Couldn't stop one, man, cause I've shot every gun And now, back to Inside Track. Hi there, while well, we have a uh, small problem dropping a guest on the 3.30 hour, Eric Press decided to stay with us at our request. We appreciate that very much, Eric, because you're a great guest. Seven nine. 02040 if anybody wants to join up. I want to run this one by you. You probably noticed, but in case you haven't, it was the um, Rasmussen poll on most voters opposing Obama acting alone on gun control. Guess what? 34% of the Democrats don't even like it. Hello? I, I thought it was especially good, too, because... Uh, CNN, of course, had their own poll. Uh, they, they were running their own poll showing, supposedly, that most Americans liked what the president was doing. Uh, you know, of course, I'd like to see how they were asking those questions. Uh, I would much rather, uh, much more trust the Rasmussen poll. Uh, but irregardless, I think it really shows uh, that, uh, you know, that's just the beauty of having a constitution and a bill of rights because it really doesn't matter what the polls say. I mean, it is nice when you have the polls behind you, but even if 100% of the people were behind what Obama was doing, it wouldn't matter because the Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And Everything the president did this week was an infringement of our rights. I mean, imagine for 200 years and more uh, since we've had a, a constitution, uh, our uh, you know private citizens have been able to buy and sell firearms. And as of this week, our president has said, now that's going to stop. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of the media has been trying to sell uh, what the president did this week is, oh, you know, just some minor tweaks, etc. No. This was a really radical thing that he is imposing upon us, and uh, you know. But anyway, I'm I'm glad to see that uh, most of, most uh, Americans, according to the Rasmussen poll, uh, are upset with this. Yet there's some. They should be. Yet there are some members of his party uh, who are office holders who don't think that he went nearly far enough. Well, that's really scary, and I tell you what that. Um, <laughs> that tells you that elections have consequences, doesn't it? Well, uh, it shows. Yeah, yeah, it shows that in in the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, the Democrats who are left aren't the moderates. The Democrats who are left are the real hardcore lefties, and and See, gun confiscation and and gun control has always been almost as important as abortion and you know the other crap. Has anybody they're... seen a conservative Democrat since Zell Miller? <laughs> Well, I tell you, they, I think Nancy Pelosi tried to purge them and, and did so successfully out of the party. Um, yeah, there's maybe one or two in the Congress. There's, there's really, I, and if there is, they don't come right to mind. Um, you know, and I understand there's some pro-gun conservative Democrats out in the heartland of America. I get that. Uh, they just don't make it to Congress. <laughs> yeah, and they don't make it usually to state legislators in, some, in most states either. And then we got, you know, problems like whole states like California that really, you know, maybe, maybe, well, I won't say it. I was going to say something about maybe an earthquake would be in order, but oh well. <clears throat> well, Eric, the, the, the whole thing with uh, California, for example, coming here from Arizona, my wife travels back and forth uh, from Tucson to San Diego. Um, she's been afraid to uh, keep you know, her, her uh, uh, firearm with her in the car going across the state border because she's afraid that, you know, she would have, if she got a ticket or something, she'd have to declare that she had uh, the firearm in the car 
and she's automatically broken a law and has all kinds of problems, even though, you know, she she had a concealed carry permit for, for years and has done all of the stuff that you need to do to keep that current. Yeah, this is a real frustration. Um, there is no reason why somebody who is able to carry concealed in one state cannot go outside of their state. Uh, I mean, we, we do that with cars, right? I mean, if you can drive in one state, uh, you can drive into another. And it doesn't even matter if states have different standards, let's say in terms of what age. Uh, some states, you can't get your driver's license until you're 17 or 18, and yet a 16-year-old from Virginia can still drive into that state. You know, you know where we've seen this to be a real problem is for people like, let's say, Shanine Allen who, uh, you know, very well-known case now, she's a Philadelphia resident. She'd been burglarized, and she decided, you know, I'm a single mom with uh, two young kids, and and I need to be able to protect them. So she got, she went through the training, got a concealed carry permit. She was in, um, uh, you know, I I forget why she was over across the border in New Jersey. It may have been work-related. But anyway, she was pulled over, and although never really given a reason why, she wasn't speeding, I uh, wasn't given a reason why, but the officer's first question to her was, um, do you have a gun in the car? She answered honestly, yes, I do. I have a concealed carry permit. But, And, wow, did that start a whole legal nightmare for her. She was arrested. And, uh, you know, finally the governor did, um, uh, you know, uh, end up pardoning her or commuting uh, her sentence. But it was a real long ordeal. Um, sometimes we've seen cases where it's cost people's lives. You know, you, you mentioned uh, your wife uh, uh, won't carry when she uh, crosses the border. Well, we've seen cases like that. There was a guy named Sandy Havel, and you might remember the Michael McDermott shooting up in sure. Massachusetts in the late 90s. Well, Sandy Havel was a New Hampshire resident with a concealed carry permit, an Army veteran, and his job would require him to go sometimes to the Massachusetts office. But being the law-abiding citizen that he was, he wouldn't carry his gun with him. And that happened to be one of the days when he was there shortly after Christmas. Michael McDermott came into the office. Sandy Havel confronted McDermott, but... You know, he tried to talk him down. I mean, that's all he could do. He didn't have his gun with him. Imagine if he did. I mean, here's an Army veteran. Why should he have been without a firearm? He could have stopped Michael McDermott. Instead, Michael McDermott shot him and killed him. A very, I mean, it's, it's like a, a double tragedy. I mean, not only were several people killed in that office building, but somebody who'd been <laughs> trained as a career with firearms uh, and could have had the opportunity to stop him was by law, prevented from defending himself and others. What, what is the real psychological reason and the real political reason behind the gun grabber and the hoplophobe mentality? What really is it? Well, I, you know, I think in this Have we country, got more than one variant on the illness here? On the illness? Yeah, well, I, yeah no, because I, I, I really, think it is an illness. I'm sorry. I, I, I do think in this country the main, it, it, it's... You know, people have a delusion that if we get rid of the guns, we're going to be safer. And, and I really think that's what drives them. Now, obviously, when you look at history and you look worldwide, uh, you see a much more pernicious reason for taking away firearms from people. And you just look at places like Cambodia and China and the Soviet Union. Th- those were preludes. Gun control was a prelude to... Uh, confiscating firearms and then committing genocide against the people. Now, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that that's what the average American gun control advocate uh, wants. Uh, obviously, I, I think going back to my earlier statement, I think it's just the, the mistaken delusion that, you know, they, they believe what the media tells them that we'll be safer. And, and for a lot of people on the left, I mean, it's almost it's their creed. You know, I mean, it's, we, it's a, almost like a religious thing with them. It, it really is. Well, and do you know why? It's because their worldview says that government should take care of everything and fix everything. So this fits neatly in with that worldview, which is, well, government will be there to protect us, which, of course, is absurd. I mean, there's even a book written called the title was Dial 911 and Die. And it, the, the book was just full of stories of people who called 911 and the police didn't get there in time. But if they had been armed, they would have had 
plenty of time to, you know, to actually defend themselves. I mean, it, it's kind of a, a downer of a book, but it makes the point that, you know, government can't be there to protect us. I mean, so we should be able to carry firearms because, hey, you can't carry a cop, right? If I may <laughs> jump in here with a question, with this business on the mental health issue, uh, Eric, do you see uh, foresee where this could lead down the road that uh, before you can purchase a firearm, you would have to go through a psychiatric evaluation or a psychological... Check up from the neck up. Yep. Well, absolutely. And in fact, uh, other countries do do that. I mentioned France uh, and their uh, strict, strict gun control laws, and, and they have that. So we, we actually see that in other countries. These other countries have the gun control laws that guys like uh, Michael Bloomberg and Barack Obama could only dream of having here. You know that they would love to have here. And, but just imagine how horribly that could be abused because, uh, you know, that could be everything from, um, uh, you know, not balancing your checkbook as currently being applied and PTSD and taking anxiety medicines to uh, what kind of views do you hold? Eventually, uh, you know, we can just make everybody dependent upon the government. All 100% of us will all be decreed to be in need of government service. And we will be so much safer, won't we? <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, let's go ahead and catch a break. We'll be right back with Eric Pratt. Inside Track will be right back. Now, back to Inside Track. Hi there. Welcome back. We're with Eric Pratt from Gun Owners of America for one more segment. Eric, you know, there's a, I'm trying to bring the exact wording because it's so well done, but uh, our colleague uh, Charles Heller has a, a, a America Armed and Free on, on Sunday, and one of the promos he has for that show is, uh, and I can't remember the name, and maybe Charles, if you're listening, you can call in or somebody else can tell us, but it's a wonderful comparison of between us and them and the natural rights issue as opposed to, which is something that's hardware that's wired into you as opposed to the uh, belief that you get issued your rights by government and it's software we add on. I think it was a wonderful comparison, and I thought I'd lay it on you, because I think it is the difference between us and them. They, they do not believe in national rights, natural rights. Well, exactly. I mean, our Declaration of Independence says that our rights come from God. You know, all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And yeah, that you, word you don't even, you don't even have to be a Christian or, a, or a, a, a theist to believe. You'd be an atheist and believe that you have natural rights, because I know some that do. Exactly. And, and, but that word unalienable means that it can't. That these rights cannot be taken away from you. And, and, of course, I mean, it really does come out of a Christian worldview. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but it comes out of a Christian worldview. Yes, it does. It, it's the idea that we're made in the image of God. Therefore, we're different than animals. So animals don't have rights in the same way that humans. I mean, that's why we can eat, you know, hamburger and uh, you know, not go to jail for doing that. And a bunch of guys and, but, but, on a bunch of guys on their side think animals have every bit as much rights as we do because they've issued them to them. See, exactly. But see, if if you've rejected the foundation that our rights come from God, then it does become very. Then how do you decide who or what has rights? It becomes a question of well, can you feel pain, or are you intelligent, or? Uh, you know, you, you or am I in charge with, and I'll decide for you? Thank you very much. But, yes, and and that becomes what what's pernicious and scary. So so the modern lefty views rights as coming from government. So why wouldn't they think that infringing the Second Amendment right? Yeah, you know, it's like that's not a big deal. No, because the, what the government giveth, the government can take away. Bingo, and that same holds true the, for the rest of them. Let's go to speaking of Charles. Charles, you're up. There is no designer but Colt, and his and John Moses Browning is his prophet. <laughs> Another very good quote. Wasn't that, 
<laughs> Wasn't that the statement you were looking for? Well, it was actually your 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 uh, the hardwired versus uh, software oh, promo. That is uh, that is actually G. Edward Griffin's voice that you're hearing, the author of the creature from Jekyll Island, and he okay. says that uh, uh, leftists believe that your uh, that your rights are software programmed into you by government. And constitutionalists are people who believe, as Eric just up very eloquently stated, hi, Eric, um, very eloquently. Hello, sir. Hi. And, and thank you for the work that you and your, your, and your dad's organization do for the country. And everybody listening should take a minute away from AML and go to goa.org and join his organization. It's a very, very worthwhile, no compromise, self-defense civil rights organization. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. This is Charles Heller. I'm the... You know me from, from JPFL. Yes. So anyway, that's but they were a, an excellent organization and listen to him. He carries the message very, very well. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, and Charles. Thank you for doing your show by by the way, my friend. We appreciate you. Anyway, that's a, that 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 is a fundamental difference. And and you were remarking, Bruce, on the break. So I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. And I don't know why, but most of my friends seem to be liberal, and they seem to be very fascinated with what conservatives think, but they don't believe any of it. They're just they're just sort of <laughs> fascinated by it. And and one evening we started talking about natural law, and and one of those natural law rights being the right to defend yourself. And she looked at me as if I was from another universe. She said, I have absolutely no idea what you were talking about, this whole no. natural oh. rights thing. She and this is a college educated uh person. There's she, a problem. She, she has you know she has the degree. She's she's lived, you know, a fine life. She's not some kid who's who's unaware of the world. You know, she's she's a mature uh, individual. And it was as if I was talking to somebody like they had just come to this planet from someplace else. So, and I said, so if I was to just jump out of my chair and come over there and try to beat the bejesus out of you, what would you do? She says, well, I try, I try to make sure that you don't hurt me. I said, that's what a natural right is. That's a natural right to, to self-defense. And she still was a little curious about the whole thing. You know, a lot of times, sadly, it takes being victimized for... You know, the old adage that uh, conservative is a liberal who's been mugged, and, and there are many like yeah. that who were dyed-in-the-wool, anti-gun yeah. yeah. liberals. That was my wife. They... That was my wife until she was mugged in a, in a Safeway parking lot, and that lady who tried to uh, grab her purse from her, she wasn't going to give that up for anything in the universe. And the next thing she did, I, I happened to have been out of the country when this happened. She was absolutely, you know, uh, shaken up, uh, more sure. shaken up than I've ever seen her before. And we've known each other for over 50 years. And the next thing she did was start taking self-defense classes. And she bought her first uh, firearm. And she's probably got as many guns as my son and, and me. <laughs> uh, and she loves it. And she's a better shot than both of us put together. Yeah, I've, I've seen that story played out many times. Um, and, you know, I mean, sometimes it, it's sad that it has to come to that, but, right. uh, but otherwise when people are left in their ivory tower and they're told, well, this is the way the world should be, and it's never really affected them, they've never been victimized, it's easy to think that, that, well, we'll just be safer off by collecting all the guns, as if that could really happen, but, uh, you know, I mean, one of the craziest cases, actually a, a woman who lives in my hometown, uh, complete anti-gunner. Uh, two people were in her home ransacking the home. She slipped into her bedroom and locked the door. She was literally straddling the window in her uh, the second level of, of her house. And when they came to her bedroom door and jiggled the, uh, the doorknob, she yelled out, Get out of here! I have a shotgun! Which, of course, was a total lie. But the next thing she saw was these two running out the front door, yelling profanities and running down the street. That changed her whole world view. Mm -hmm. uh, she became a conservative. Uh, same thing as, as your wife. She started taking classes. She owns guns now. Um, you know that that's uh, sometimes what it takes. All right, Eric. We got about four minutes and two callers. Let's try Kevin. Yeah, the the natural rights thing was clearly understood by the founders, um, and when they developed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, 
they actually put the Second Amendment in their, in their reference to the militia because they actually did not want to have a standing army. It was exactly it, it, what you know, and and, and the, the Second Amendment is there for one reason, really, and one reason only in law, and that is to protect, to prevent a tyrannical usurpation of the citizens of the country's rights. Who had that and, bumper sticker that said the Second Amendment isn't about duck hunting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and the the thing about it is, is that the way I've always looked at it is that the five things that are mentioned in the First Amendment, if every government adhered to those five things, it'd be a pretty good government. And what yeah, there wouldn't second, be a lot of it. Yeah, there wouldn't be. And what's in the second place? Let me see. It's the right, okay, to defend our country with militia. The reason that they made West Point was if the gov if the president called the militias up, which was every citizen, okay, to defend us against England or France or some European power, we had a cadre of trained officers out of West Point to be able to get us into position and fight against the the people that were coming to d take our freedom away and take our country. And and it traditionally in uh, English common law it was based on that, they, they said that should the government ever gain so much power and turn their professional standing army against the people, the people will always be armed and be able to throw off the yoke of oppression. It's pretty simple. Yeah, the Jap you, Japanese weren't very happy about the prospect of facing <laughs> hundreds of thousands of Californians in those days who had guns, knew how to use them, and would shoot anybody coming uh, uh, on the shore. Not to mention That's the people exactly in Washington right. and Oregon. Exactly right. Yeah. All right, Kevin. All right. Thank you. I got to go. Man. On. Bye, I got to move on. Luis. Not, to, not a law. We eat cattle poultry and pigs because they didn't defend the right to possess firearms. <laughs> Very good we, point, Luis. We don't need lion, tiger, wolf, or even elephant. Thank you. <laughs> Very, very good. Although I know somebody who has chowed down on an elephant foot once, but that's another story. Thank you, Luis. <laughs> good comment. Uh, hey, Eric, aren't, aren't we looking at probably a decade of lawsuits and court decisions and, and lots of people who are going to be in danger because of the actions that the president took this week? That's if you get the wrong president. If you get the right he president, you rescind it and move on. Exactly. So, you know, we, we are, our guy is Ted Cruz, but, uh, yeah, we, we need somebody in there that will rescind it. Uh, this year we're going to be working on defunding it, and so I, I really encourage people, if they haven't gone to our website, go to gunowners.org, gunowners with an S dot O-R-G. Sign up for our free email alerts because we're going to be putting the heat on these guys. The New York Times lamented in 2013 that it was our email activist list that uh, killed gun control in the Senate because, uh, as PBS said, when we put out an alert, it lights up the lines in the Congress. And that actually kept a lot of the Republicans who were, uh, before that, were actually trying to work out a compromise, a gun control compromise with the Democrats. It gave them a spinal transplant, and they said, whoop, no way. And, uh, and you know, the, the Times wasn't too happy about that, but uh, that we're happy when they're unhappy. So, uh, you know, that's how that works. <laughs> so gunowners.org is the place to sign up for our free email alerts. All right, Eric, this time we're saying goodbye for good because we're out of time. Thank At least you, goodbye sir, for today. Thank you very much for being with us. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Eric. Right, Happy New